Committee will come to order. Uh, this is our first meeting of the TARP financial services and bailouts of public and private programs. Um, I will uh, begin by making an opening statement. I certainly appreciate the, the panel of witnesses being here uh, and taking the opportunity to be here. Uh, today's hearing is an opportunity to discuss growing concerns over the potential fiscal crisis looming for states and municipalities. Over the past three years, we have seen a culture arise where every institution claimed it was too big to fail. An all too eager President and an all too compliant Congress kept putting taxpayers on the hook for trillions of dollars. Our budget deficit has reached an all time high, and the national debt is crippling our economy. Now we are facing the consequences of bad government policy in yet another way. State and municipal governments who are preparing for aggregate budget shortfalls totaling roughly $125 billion this year are struggling under a trillion-dollar burden of unfunded pension liabilities, plummeting tax revenues, and an unforgiving bond market. We must understand the magnitude of this problem to avoid the reactionary ad hoc decision-making that fueled the Federal action of the 2008 financial crisis. This is not about one analyst. This is about the looming fiscal crisis in states and municipalities and the lack of transparency in their pension obligations. Let us be clear about this. The perfect storm is brewing. Already state and municipal governments are coming to Washington, hat in hand, expecting a Federal bailout like so many others. But the era of the bailout is over. That does not mean, however, that Congress must turn a blind eye or a deaf ear to the crisis unfolding in State and local governments. The beauty of Federalism lies in the fact that the National Government does not tell the States how to manage their own affairs, at least ideally. The burden of Federalism is that when one State, or all 50 States, are in a crisis, we must work together to solve them for the good of the country. Since 1990, State and local government spending has increased roughly 70 percent faster than inflation. The vast majority of the, state, of the States now find themselves in a fiscal straitjacket caused primarily by the looming burden of paying out trillions of dollars in lucrative public sector, pension, uh, public sector union pensions and health care benefits that come at the expense of taxpayers. For the last three years, funding for, from the Stimulus Act has masked the severity of the State fiscal challenges. In fact, there was $140 billion in transfers from the Federal Government to the States included in the stimulus. States now say that the money would, would help them, more money would help them through their current rough patch. The reality, however, is that the money States receive from the stimulus has in many ways made them worse off. A lot of the funding comes with, quote, maintenance of effort, end quote, requirements that force States to keep funding programs after Federal funding dries up this year. More money from Washington would just delay the day of reckoning and, uh, and only further complicate State fiscal situations. Besides, we don't have any more money. And beyond that, the simple fact is that the government has outgrown our capacity to pay for it. There will be severe consequences for not changing course. Young teachers fresh out of college and ready to give back to their communities will be told that their school districts cannot provide them with reasonable retirement benefits because they are cash strapped to pay for the exorbitant benefits of others. Firefighters, policemen and other public servants facing the reality that their vital jobs offer no promise of rising standards of living for their family or benefits will simply opt for a different career path. In the end, people will recognize that their government has failed them. But not only that, they believe that their government has actively hurt them. While we have the opportunity to change that, we are responsible to try. This is why we are here today, to come to a better understanding of the crisis at the State and local government level, to assess its causes and to consider available solutions. With that in mind, this hearing, I intend to shed light on how states arrive at their current, uh, at how the states arrived at their current predicament, what is the current extent of their fiscal distress, and uh, what needs to be done in terms of available solutions. 
My friend and colleague from California, Representative Devin Nunes, has a proposal that re would require greater transparency at the point of most urgent concern, the pension problem. I have been happy to work with him on this legislation. I look forward to hearing from both sides uh, on any and all possible solutions, and that is why we have this uh, great panel here today. Uh, let there be no mistake, though. Much is required to get our fiscal house in order, not just at the State and local levels, but here in Washington, D.C. But reckless spending fueled by bottom bottomless borrowing and guaranteed by endless bailouts is an unsustainable course. And with that, uh, I now uh, recognize the ranking member, uh, Mr. Quigley of Illinois, Thank you, for five Chairman. minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this uh, extraordinarily important and timely hearing. And uh, congratulations on your new post as Chairman. Um, the record should reflect that you and your staff have been extraordinarily uh, accommodating and cordial to myself and my staff. Uh, obviously, the issues are too important to divide us in, in any light. Uh, and I also thank you for agreeing that, that any time I take compliment of you should not count against my time to speak. <laughs> I want to thank our four witnesses for testifying today. Um, and I agree. Uh, today is really, in a sense, not about bailouts or bankruptcies, because I don't think either one of those options uh, can work or is optimal. Uh, but as you know, I'm from Illinois, and you don't need to tell me about how bad its finances are and how critical these issues are. Illinois has gone through decades of bad financial decision making under both Democrats and Republicans. Illinois now has an $8 billion backlog in payments and a gaping $136 billion hole in its pension system, leaving its pension less than 50 percent funded. It should be no surprise then that the rating agencies have downgraded Illinois bond issuances several times in the past 12 months. Last year, Illinois bonds carried the worst credit risk of any U.S. state and were only slightly less risky than bonds from Iraq. According to Lawrence Massal of the Civic Federation, this bad, rating, this bad rating was costing Illinois taxpayers $551 million a year extra in interest payments. And total debt service in Illinois is expected to increase by 33 percent between now and the year 2017. The only way Illinois was able to climb out from a bottom rung was to raise state income taxes a whopping 66 percent, an outcome no one wanted. This tax increase brought Illinois' bond rating back up and reduced borrowing costs, but only by passing those costs on to Illinois taxpayers. Illinois has to reform its pension system, but it also has to reform its whole way of doing business, which has left retirees vulnerable and taxpayers on the hook. As Professor Dershowitz said of Harvard's shrinking endowment after the 90s boom, a lesson for all of us. People forgot the story of Joseph in Genesis. During the seven good years, you, seven, you save for the several lean years. Illinois didn't save for the seven lean years, and now it has to deal with the consequences. That said, what is going on in Illinois is not necessarily what is going on everywhere else. True, most states have recently rung up large deficits thanks to a collapse in tax revenues during the recession. But this short-term fiscal problem will improve as our economy gets going again. The real problem is an actuarial, actuarial problem unique to six to eight states, including Illinois, which suffer from long-term structural imbalances. The corporates are rising health costs, underfunded pension plans, and poor financial management. Some of these pension plans took, look particularly bad right now because of the collapse in the value of pension assets. But even an appreciation in asset value will leave several state pension plans underfunded. The municipal bond market is now <clears throat> responding to legitimate concerns about the long-term structural imbalances in these six to eight states. But I believe we would be correct to distinguish these bad apples from the other 40-some states that have been relatively well managed and only have temporary deficits. That is why a one-size-fits-all approach like, like bankruptcy for states could do more harm than good. What we have to avoid is any rash action that would contribute new risk factors to the bond market. State and local governments across the country need to continue building roads and bridges, and we don't want to make the financing any more expensive than it already is. So we need to be crystal clear that although there are national interests at stake, 
The onus must be on those State governments to reform themselves. They need to reform sooner than later. A default on payments would make it obscenely expensive for all States to borrow. Taxpayers would bear the brunt of these costs either through higher taxes or through reduced public services and a move towards austerity. Mr. Chairman, I don't want Illinois problem or a New Jersey problem to become a national problem. These States have to institute common sense reforms to shore up their finances. At the same time, government's mission matters and successful reform will ensure that workers get the pensions they have earned through the years of service. All we need is the political will to get it done. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses on this matter and the discussions of the next possible steps. Thank you, and I yield back. I, I thank you, Mr. Quigley, and, and you certainly have been wonderful to work with, uh, and we certainly appreciate that. Uh, this certainly isn't a shirts versus skins or Republican versus Democrat issue. It's, I think, uh, trying to get to the, uh, the understand the depth of this problem is, is certainly behooves uh, both parties and, and the American people and their right to know. Uh, I want to begin, before we introduce the panel, um, we have the mission statement of the Oversight Committee, and uh, at the Chairman's uh, request, I would like to read that for all that are here today. Uh, we exist to secure two fundamental principles. First, Americans have the right to know that the money Washington takes, for them, takes from them is well spent. And second, Americans deserve an efficient, effective government that works for them. Our duty on the Oversight and Government Reform Committee is to protect these rights. Our solemn responsibility is to hold government accountable to taxpayers because taxpayers have a right to know what they get from their government. We will work tirelessly in, in partnering with citizen watchdogs to deliver the facts to the American people and bring genuine reform to the Federal bureaucracy. This is the mission statement. This is the mission of the Oversight and Government Reform Committee. So with that in mind, I would like to introduce today's panel. Uh, Nicole Jelanus uh, is the Searle Freedom Trust Fellow at the Manhattan Institute and contributing editor of City Paper. Uh, Jelanus uh, writes in urban economics and finance, municipal and corporate finance and business issues. She is a chartered financial uh, analyst, uh, uh, charter holder, and a member of the New York Society of Securities Analysts. Her most recent book, After the Fall, Saving Capitalism from Wall Street and, and Washington, uh, was about the financial crisis of 2008 and was published in November 2009. He is the author of Icarus in the Boardroom, uh, published in 2005, and Debt's Dominion, Our History of Bankruptcy Law, in America, published in 2001, as well as numerous articles and other publications. Uh, Eileen Norcross is a senior research fellow with, uh, with the Social Change Project and the lead researcher on the state and local public policy project. Her work for, focuses on the questions of how societies sustain prosperity and the role civil society plays in supporting economic resiliency. Her areas of research include fiscal fed federalism and institutions, state and local governments, and economic development. Uh, Iris J. Lav is a senior advisor with the Center on Budget and, and Policy Priorities. Uh, prior to joining the Center, she was Associate Director of Public Policy for the American Federation of State, County, and Municipal Employees and a senior associate at a consulting firm. Thank you all for being here today. Members will have uh, seven we will have seven days to submit opening statements for the record. Uh, it is the policy of this committee uh, that all witnesses be sworn in before they testify. Will you please rise and raise your right hands? Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you are about to give this committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you. Thank you. And the record will reflect that all answered in the affirmative. Thank you. And we will certainly begin. Uh, Ms. Jelanus, with you. Uh, you will have five minutes uh, to give your opening statement. Uh, at uh, one minute remaining, the yellow light will come up. If you could just summarize your opening statements, everyone uh, has, has that for the record. Um, and we will begin with you. Yes, good morning, Chairman McHenry. You will bring the microphone closer. Thank you. Good morning, Chairman McHenry, Ranking Member Quigley, members of the subcommittee. Thank you for inviting me to testify today on this important topic. Congress is right to worry about 
the choice between bailing out states and watching as they risk repudiating their long-term obligations to bondholders and other creditors, including union members. The good news is that Congress can still act to avoid this difficult choice. The bad news is that a state bankruptcy statute is not going to be the answer. Sometimes arriving at a solution means eliminating the bad solutions. So I will talk for a few moments about why state bankruptcy is not the answer and talk for my remaining moments about what are some of the answers. Proponents of a bankruptcy statute for states say that special interests have taken over the state budgeting process, that there is no prospect of states getting their long-term pension obligations, health care obligations to retirees, and debt obligations under control absent an external force outside the state political process. Proponents believe that this could be the external force. In this scenario, states could threaten bankruptcy to wring concessions from their creditors, particularly labor unions, changing future pension benefits, health care benefits, and the like. Bondholders who would be worried about this prospect would force states to do this before they get into a crisis situation. As a practical matter, though, bankruptcy is unlikely to help states solve their fiscal problems and actually would add new problems. One reason is how states have structured their bond obligations. When many people think of money that a state owes, they think of a state's general obligation bonds, bonds against which the state has pledged its full faith and credit to pay back its debt. States do not issue only general obligation bonds, though. They issue bonds through hundreds of public authorities. New York State, for example, owes nearly $80 billion in debt. Only about $3.5 billion of that is through general obligation debt. The remainder is through hundreds of these public authorities, special purpose vehicles, and so forth. Each of these authorities is its own corporation. It is not an agency or an arm of the state. It has its own board of directors, its own covenants with bondholders, its own legal and contractual agreements with not only bondholders but employees and retirees. There is no practical way for a state to pool all of this debt together in, in one place, along with pension and health care obligations, hand it over to a judge and pair it back, at least not without violating thousands of pre-existing covenants, contracts with bondholders, and state laws. And this gets to Congressman Quigley's point that, uh, that the Congressman made in his opening statement. Changing the rules mid-game would affect not only states that have gotten themselves into trouble with their own decisions, such as New York, California, Illinois, New Jersey, but also states that are not running these long-term deficits. Introducing a bankruptcy statute would force bondholders to all states to question the legal regime. It would take many months to sort out the uncertainty. During those months, it is quite likely that states would have to pay more on their debt. Another practical problem with bankruptcy is that states are not like corporations where one person can be authorized to speak for the state. In a corporate bankruptcy, you have a CEO, an agent of the CEO, and a small board of directors all speaking as one. In a state bankruptcy, hundreds of state lawmakers could not give their power to a governor to speak in one voice. It, bankruptcy would not eclipse the normal processes of democracy. You would still have hundreds of lawmakers speaking in different voices before a judge. No way for a judge to, to simply take over this, this process of democracy and, and solve the state's obligations from, from on high. Another problem is that states do not owe pension benefits for the most part. States administer pension benefits on behalf of local governments, cities, towns, and school districts. So bankruptcy for the state would not take care of pension obligations. Municipalities can do that through changes in state law, requires changes in state law. But municipalities can already declare bankruptcy if that is a way for them to deal with their pension obligations. So this does not add a benefit to municipalities who owe pension and health care benefits. What are some of the other solutions that Congress can look to to help states and municipalities pay back their benefits? One thing is un making sure to states that Congress understands that states already have the tools to deal with these things themselves. States can change their laws that govern pensions.
States can change their laws that govern contracts, health care benefits. They do not need to look to Congress to do this for them. And with that, I will conclude my opening remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jones. Uh, Mr. Skeel. Well, it is a great honor to appear before you, and I am tempted to say everything that Nicole just said, uh, uh, not. Um, not exactly that, but uh, I will just make one comment uh, at the outset, and that is uh, we have lots of experience deal dealing with complicated bankruptcies. So the fact that it is a multitude of entities is not news in, um, in the bankruptcy context. I would be happy to address questions about that or uh, either of the other issues that were just raised if folks are interested. Currently, if a State's financial crisis spirals out of control, we, we really only have two options. The first is that a State might simply default on some of its obligations, declaring itself unable to pay. The second option is for the Federal Government to bail out one or more of the States as it bailed out uh, financial institutions like Bear Stearns, Fannie Mae, F Freddie Mac, and AIG during the recent financial crisis. I believe that both of these alternatives are deeply problematic and that, bankrupts that Congress, y'all, should enact a bankruptcy law for the States, not as a first resort but it is an absolute last resort in the event that everything else fails. The claim that we don't need a bankruptcy law for States strikes me as a little bit like saying there is no need for a fire department because most homeowners have never had fires in their houses, and if one starts, the homeowner can probably start it before the crisis gets out of control. Each of these things is true, but we still need fire departments for the rare case when a fire does burn out of control. In the remainder of my discussion, I would like to make three simple points. First, bankruptcy would provide several enormously important benefits that we don't have in the absence of, ben of bankruptcy. Second, it is constitutionally permissible, in case you all are concerned about that, as, as well you should be. Third, the law could be tailored to address any particular concerns you might have about things like it being too easy for a state to file or there be the bankruptcy law being too harsh for particular kinds of constituencies. So let me say, uh, to the extent I have time, a brief word about uh, each. First, the benefits that bankruptcy would provide for a troubled state. Um, one of the main benefits bankruptcy would provide is a way to restructure some kinds of obligations that probably can't be restructured outside of bankruptcy. And I would include pensions in that. There are real limits on what can be done with pensions outside of bankruptcy. I would include bonds in that category as well. The other huge benefit of bankruptcy is, if it is necessary as an absolute last resort, is it brings everybody to the table. We don't just have one or two constituencies that get singled out to make sacrifices. We get everybody to the table and we ask, how can we distribute the sacrifices so that it makes sense and we can put our finances on a fiscally sustainable course? My second point is that bankruptcy is fully constitutional, um, even with respect to states. Um, all that needs to be done there, there, there are genuine state sovereignty concerns, and they need to be honored, but they can be honored so long as we make sure the bankruptcy law is entirely voluntary, meaning that a state couldn't be thrown into bankruptcy against its will, and the bankruptcy law would also need to ensure that state decision, governmental decision-making functions were not interfered with. All of these are things we already do with respect to municipal bankruptcy. My final point is that the law can be tailored to deal with any concerns you all may have. A lot of the discussion, a lot of the criticism of state bankruptcy seems to assume there is only one possible state bankruptcy law we can have, and it is going to require us to cut everything down to zero. That is not the case. If you are worried about 
states being too anxious to file for bankruptcy, that there'll be a strategic use of bankruptcy. I think that's uh, not really a serious worry. But if you are worried about it, all you have to do is put some entrance requirements on bankruptcy. We, we already do this with municipal bankruptcy. If you're worried about the bond markets, you're worried the bond markets are going to be concerned because they're afraid that bonds are going to be written down to zero, you put restrictions as a prerequisite to doing anything with bonds. So the final point is uh, simply that we can tailor the bankruptcy law to address any concerns we may have. My bottom line is bankruptcy is not a perfect solution. It would be messy. It is an absolute last resort, but it's better than the other last resorts, which are states simply defaulting on their obligations or a federal bailout. Thank you, Mr. Skeel. Uh, Ms. Norcross? Chairman McHenry, Ranking Member Quigley, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for inviting me to testify today on this important topic. The recent recession exposed several longstanding problems in State budgets that have left unaddressed the underlying causes for these short-term budget gaps, and including public sector pension benefits and the rising cost of health care, are certain to worsen State's prospects for stability and economic growth. But with reform today, States can mitigate the worst while meeting their promises to employees and taxpayers. The recent downturn is only one cause for recent State budget gaps. State and local spending has grown faster than State's own source revenues and the private economy over the past several decades. The fastest growing area of State budgets is Medicaid. States have avoided showing deficits in part due to Federal funds and an increasing reliance on debt finance, and in some cases by deferring their contributions to pension systems, not funding health care benefits, or borrowing to make pension payments. These techniques help states show balance, grow spending, and pass the costs on to the future. Without any changes, GAO anticipates state and local governments will require an annual and sustained reduction in spending of 12.3 percent or an equivalent increase in revenues between 2009 and 2058 to close a projected $9.9 .9 trillion fiscal gap. In addition, state and local governments face a large funding gap in their pension systems. Governments report the unfunded liability for state and local pensions at $1 trillion, but economists estimate it closer to $3.5 trillion. According to government accounting standards, the discount rate used to value plan liabilities may be based on what the assets are expected to return when invested, an average of 8 percent annually. This violates economic theory, which says the value of a liability is independent from how it is financed. Choosing the discount rate requires matching that rate with what is being valued, in this case a public sector pension, which is safe, government guaranteed, and thus should be matched with a rate that reflects that safety, such as the yield on Treasury bonds, currently at 4 percent. The circular logic of government pension accounting standards has had several consequences for pension funding. It has led to the undervaluing of pension promises and the amount necessary to be set aside to fund the promise. Plans have been encouraged to embrace more investment risk, including increasing their risk exposure after the recent market downturn to make up for losses. Union leaders and politicians in negotiations in the 1990s when the market was booming often boosted benefit formulas because plans looked overvalued on paper. Governments have also, as mentioned, deferred payments to the systems and issued bonds. When are plans likely to run out of assets? Economist Joshua Rao of Northwestern University estimates under the generous assumption, the State's own assumption of an 8 percent annual return on pension assets, that by decade's end, eight States will run out of assets to pay their beneficiaries. Illinois will require $11 billion annually beginning in 2019 in this scenario. New Jersey will require $10 billion annually in 2021. A less dire scenario is offered by the Center for Retirement Research at Boston College. To remain funded, by 2014, Illinois will require 13 percent of its budget to ensure fund solvency. New Jersey will require 12.5 percent of its budget. This requires choices these states have to date avoided making. Other economists and actuaries have produced equally dire scenarios, as Dr. Rao. But ultimately, I stress it is incumbent upon State governors and treasurers to ask actuaries to stress test their pension systems under a range of assumptions. I believe the biggest impact the Federal Government can have in helping the States is in the area of Medicaid reform and mandate relief. For State pensions, I have two recommendations. 
First, transparent and accurate accounting. Governments must stress test their pension systems and model the cash flows to determine what will be needed to set aside to pay these promises. These scenarios should include the risk-free discount rate as recommended by economists. The data, method, and assumptions should be made available to the public. Secondly, stabilize public sector pension systems. To pay what has been promised while minimizing the burden on taxpayers, states should consider freezing or reducing the cost of living adjustment in current defined benefit plans, increasing the retirement age, increasing contributions from workers, and importantly, close the defined benefit plan and move workers to a defined contribution plan. The last reform will allow workers more flexibility, shift risk away from taxpayers, and end the political and fiscal manipulation of worker benefits, which has turned what was supposed to be a safe investment for public sector workers into a gamble for both employees and taxpayers. Accurate accounting will enable states to know the trade-offs necessary today, and delay will only ensure what is a big problem turns into a crisis by decade's end. Thank you. I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Ms. Ms. Norcross. Uh, Ms. Lapp. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, Mr. Quigley, members of the committee, thank you uh, for the invitation to appear before you today. Um, I believe that predictions that states throughout the country will have to bail out localities or that the Federal Government will have to bail out the states are substantially exaggerated. And I think they are producing unnecessary alarm among policymakers and the public at large. I would like to untangle some of these claims today about cyclical issues, bonds, and pensions. First, cyclical issues. States are projecting large operating deficits, as you said, of about $125 billion for the uh, 2012 fiscal year, which begins in July in most states. Unemployment remains high, revenues remain below pre-recession levels, and there is rising demand for public services due to the weak economy and growing populations. Uh, figure one, please. Uh, moreover, the fiscal relief provided through the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act in 2009 is ending. Mm, that is not mine. That is someone else's? Okay. Um, it has been enormously helpful in allowing states to avert potential budget cuts and tax increases. States have used the fiscal relief to cover about one-third of their budget shortfalls through the current fiscal year, but only about $6 billion will be uh, available for next year, covering less than 5 percent of these shortfalls. Oh, my charts aren't here. As difficult and painful as the choices are, states and localities will balance their upcoming budgets through budget cuts, tax increases, and use of reserve funds. That is what they do. And remember, it is a cyclical problem that will shrink in size as the economy continues to recover and state revenues continue to grow. Second, bonds. So there is no credible evidence of a bubble or crisis in state and local bonds. If we could go to figure three, please. First, interest payments on state and local bonds absorb just 4 to 5 percent of current state and local expenditures, no more than they did in the 1970s. And the historical um, default rate since 1970 through several recessions has been about one-third of 1 percent. Finally, there is no large increase in bond issuance, nor are there exotic securities that hide the underlying value of the assets against which the bonds are issued, as was the case with the subprime mortgage bonds. Third, pensions, which of course is a little more complicated. There are shortfalls, as we have all said, in pension funding for future state and local retirees. States will have to address them over the next three decades or so. Um, figure four, please. Pensions were fully funded in 2000, uh, before the last two recessions, using standard accounting. The recessions reduced the value of assets, and some jurisdictions didn't make the required deposits. So this, as was mentioned, the Center for Retirement Research at Boston College finds that states and localities have about $700 billion in unfunded liabilities. That implies they have to increase their contributions on average over the next 30 years from about 3.8 percent of budgets to 5 percent of budgets. Now, that is on average. It is not Illinois. But changes to pension plans could reduce that cost, and 3.8 percent to 5 percent is not a crisis. The major controversy is over whether these traditional accounting standards are appropriate. And that $3 trillion number, which comes from economists, who measure future costs assuming a riskless uh, rate of return, such as in Treasury bonds, about 4 percent. 
uh, figure five, please. But pension funds do invest in a diversified basket of private securities. The average historical rate of return has been about 8 percent, as you can see in that chart. It may or may not be a little lower going forward, but it is quite unlikely to be just 4 percent. So the $3 trillion number is a construct. It doesn't represent the amount that pension funds have to invest to meet their obligations. The states in trouble are basically those that skipped their payments. To summarize, cyclical problems are serious but will abate as the economy improves. The muni bond market is not in a bubble or in danger of experiencing widespread defaults, and pensions need attention but in most cases are not in crisis. I see no need for Federal in intervention in these areas. States do not want or need the power to declare bankruptcy. Nor is there a need, as Mr. Nunes has suggested, for Federal legislation to require States and localities to report their pensions on a riskless rate as a condition for issuing tax-exempt bonds. And I should note there is a process going on in the Governmental Accounting Standards Board to reform, already going on two years, to reform the way pensions are reported and to put all States reporting on the same basis, which would be a transparency improvement so you could see what is going on, and to have a reasonable um, actuarial methods for reporting. And Mr. Nunes's um, proposal would short circuit that. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ms. Lav. I certainly appreciate that. And uh, we will begin the, the questioning with the Vice Chair of the Subcommittee, uh, Mr. Ginta of New Hampshire. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and, and thank each of you for coming and testifying before us today. Um, I have a couple of questions for each of you, so I'm going to try to be quick. Uh, first, with Ms. Lav, um, you had stated that uh, there is no impending or, or looming crisis at the moment. I, I guess the first question I would have is how would you define a crisis of what we're seeing with the States and their uh, obligation requirements at the levels they are at? How would you define a crisis? I would define a crisis as something States had no way of digging themselves out of. States have many, many tools um, in which to do this. So if you have to raise your pension contributions from 3.8 percent of expenditures to 5 percent of expenditures, that's probably you can accommodate that within budget, particularly after the economy recovers. And certainly there are cyclical deficits. States are finding ways to close those cyclical deficits. We don't appreciate some of the, a lot of the budget cuts states are making, which are harming low-income people and, and, um, and residents, but that's what they do. States have balanced budget requirements, and that's what they do. They manage their finances. I, I think the concern that I and others share is that as uh, States, quote, manage their finances, they are spending an extraordinarily higher amount of money percentage-wise of borrowed dollars to get us through these, quote, lean or, or challenging economic times. Uh, my State of New Hampshire has done that uh, to pay expenses. New Jersey has done that to pay expenses, which is not either good GASB accounting standard practices or it is just not good business uh, standards of practice. So. Uh, and I don't know that you had a chance to touch upon it in your verbal remarks, but I note that in your written remarks you talked about the GASB standards. My concern is at some point there is this potential of States uh, wanting to come to the Federal Government for a, quote, bailout because of what they def define as an economic challenge that they are having. I would argue something a little bit different. Uh, any responsible uh, governor, legislature, or administrator should be anticipating these challenges. And it doesn't appear that that has been done uh, in a responsible way. So I, I understand your point, but can you speak to mm -hmm. those States that are borrowing money essentially to pay for ongoing expenses? And I'm not even talking about stimulus money that they've received. I'm just talking about borrowing money. Now, very few States borrow for operating expenses. So like Illinois uh, borrows to pay, has borrowed a number of times floated bonds to make its pension contribution, which is very bad practice. Um, by and large, States borrow money for infrastructure, and you don't see any in the data any substantial run-up in borrowing um, as a percent of uh, gross State product. Uh, we have a chart there. Um, that I provided some information to you in the behind my testimony, some graphics and some state by state information on that. You don't really see any run up in borrowing. Um, it isn't good practice for states to borrow to pay their operating expenses. They should borrow for infrastructure, which, and man, you know, because that is what makes sense to do economically. So we don't approve of borrowing for operating expenses, and usually 
Um, and in the longer paper that I refer to in my um, written testimony, we do have the whole last section, does suggest that states do have, as I believe Mr. Quigley referred to in Illinois, some structural deficits, a mismatch between their expenditures and their revenues, and part, and that, and part of that, um, and they do need to take some steps to fix those mismatches. There is no question about it, but a lot of that mismatch comes from the rate of growth of health care costs in the economy. States spend a lot of their money on health care, and health care costs are growing faster than the economy, all throughout the economy, in the private sector and in the public sector. And so states which have revenues that very often grow somewhat slower than the economy because of the structure of their tax systems have a very hard time meeting their responsibilities to provide health care to those people in the states that need it, the elderly and the disabled and the poor. I, I would agree that states need to, to, to better manage the high and the budgetary challenges they are having. Um, but it sounds like you are making an argument now for bankruptcy when in your comments you suggested no. that is not necessary at this point because of the looming you know, uh, fiscal challenges that they are having. But I do, do want to ask. They don't need bankruptcy I, to fix I, these problems. I, I do want to ask Ms. Norcross if you would be able to comment a little bit on, on the testimony we just heard. Certainly. Um, I think I would like to explain the discount rate controversy a little bit more by way of analogy. Um, and it is important because it has informed decades of policy within the pension systems that I believe we are seeing the results of that today. And the analogy is this. Um, the reason you can't choose a discount rate based on what you think your assets will return to value the liability is if, if you consider you have a mortgage and you have, um, let us say, a mutual fund. Uh, your broker says, we think, I think you are going to return 10 percent annually on your mutual fund. That doesn't enable you to slice your mortgage in half. The, the bank doesn't send you a different mortgage statement based on that. So what that circular logic has produced uh, over the years, and certainly, yeah, in the 80s and the 90s, some of these pension plans looked fine. Um, a, they have undervalued the size of the promise. So they're, they're sort of expecting the, that rate of return will be um, taking care of the, the necessary contributions that they should be making to fund the system. And number two, when plans look overfunded on paper, it led some states to grant these really generous benefit enhancements without even doing the math. In New Jersey in 2001, uh, the state granted a 9 percent benefit increase and, and didn't even figure out what it would cost them. And that is one of the areas the Governor is trying to address right now. Um, so it, and, and remarkably, I mean, it, it violates another principle, which is you can secure a guaranteed investment with a, a high-risk stream of uh, investments. And in the short term, you are going to realize more volatility in your investments, and yet that promise is due within 15 years. So they are basically trying to secure a guaranteed payout with a high-risk uh, investment, and that's, that's the, the flawed logic. But, you know, Joshua Rao in his paper uh, he uses he uses the eight percent discount rate, and he says even that even if we grant you that, um, we're looking at funds starting to run out of assets with three percent revenue growth uh, by the end of the decade. Uh, new Jersey's actuaries also released a paper on uh, their their new reports on Friday using the eight point two five discount rate, and they say we have twelve years in in the police officers' plan. So I I hope those comments help. I thank I thank the gentleman. I, I thank you for your testimony. The gentleman's time has expired, and at the request of the subcommittee ranking member, uh, he is uh, deferred to the full committee ranking member, uh, uh, Mr. Cummings. You're recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank you and our ranking member, and I thank you for working in a bipartisan way to address this problem. Um, Ms. Lav, um, it's interesting. After listening to the vice chairman of our uh, committee, subcommittee, uh, speaking just a moment ago, I find it interesting that the National Governors Association, that is Republican and uh, Democratic governors through their chairman and vice chairman, uh, said this on uh, February 4, 2011. Allowing states to declare bankruptcy is not an authority uh, any state leader has asked for, nor would they likely use. States are sovereign entities in which <coughs> the public trust is granted to its elected leaders. The reported bankruptcy proposals suggest that a bankruptcy court is, a be is better able to overcome political differences, restore fiscal stability, and manage the finances of a state. These assertions are false and serve only to threaten the fabric of the state and local finance." End of quote. Ms. Lobb, do you uh, agree uh, with these governors uh, that the state bankruptcy proposal threatens the fabric, and, and this, these are their words, of state and local financing? Can you be brief, please? I have several questions. Yes, I do agree. Um, states have all the tools they need to manage their finances. Occasionally they, 
some one state doesn't, but they have the tools they need. And what, what uh, would you recommend as to how those states might improve their fiscal situations? Um, I think, you know, there are many uh, ways that states can improve their fiscal situations. They can move to taking a longer term look. Many of them only look one year ahead or two years ahead. They can improve their revenue systems and be sure their revenues match with their, um, with their uh, expenditures. They can have um, processes in place where they, you know, there are consequences of skipping a pension contribution. Uh, which has caused a lot of the problems we are talking about today. Um, there are many things that they can do um, to make it clearer to them, to policymakers and the public about their own situations and, um, and, and allow some oversight. But I think that states themselves have the ability to do that and that um, this recession has just been so very long and so very deep that some of the flaws, you know, have, have become apparent, but it is not going to be forever. And I think they will adjust their revenues and their expenditures to manage these problems. Well, going, um, you know, House Budget Committee Chair uh, Paul Ryan and um, the Republicans proposed cutting the Federal budget, uh, domestic discretionary, non military, non security spending approximately $40 billion this year and, and much more in the future. Wouldn't this significantly worsen the state and local government's fiscal problems? Because a lot of that money flows to the states, is that right? Yes, that's and right. This is no I, gift, is it? It's not a gift to the states. <laughs> it's, it's, no, it's not a gift. It's a penalty for the states, basically. It is uh, about a third of non security spending that Mr. Ryan wants to cut is our grants that flow through to state and local governments. And so depending, we don't have the exact number, but somewhere probably between about, uh, don't hold me exactly to it, but 10 and $13 billion would be money that the States would have to scramble on top of their existing deficits, uh, uh, additional deficits they would have to close because of these um, cuts. Isn't uh, most underfunding of State pensions due to recent dramatic declines in the stock market, which hurt investment portfolios of almost all American investors, including hedge funds, regular working people, and probably most lawmakers and staff, reporters, attendees here today, given the recent emerging recovery, uh, market upturn and projected future gains, uh, don't you agree with the analysis uh, expecting future long-term gains equally over the next 30 years to smooth out today's current problems? And the reason why I raise this, and any of you all can answer this, um, is that when the storm is over, uh, I don't want to see situations where our employees, by the way, a lot of them are working in this room today, uh, may have lost or their pensions are, and then now going to the states. State pensions have been diminished. States come out of recovery and then uh, because some states fail to make their pension payments on time, and, and you got to keep in mind that the employees, they pay, their, they, they, they have to pay, right? Right. They their have to pay. pensions come in on time. Okay. So, I mean, one of my concerns is when the storm is over, then these folks have been locked out of a lot of money that they were due. So, I mean, uh, I'll start with you, Ms. Love, and then maybe some of the others may have a comment on that. Yeah, of course, the improvement in the economy, the improvement of the market will have a lot to do with improving um, the outlook of pensions over time. And, the, um, and for most states that have not provided retroactive benefits without funding them or have not skipped pension payment contributions in the past, they will be fine. Um, you know, so for the vast majority of states will be fine um, when that occurs, as that occurs. I would, I would say that the, the only reason why workers may lose some of the benefits that are promised is because the investments have been treated as a gamble rather than secured the way they should have been secured. They have been misvalued and therefore the investment strategies have not been appropriate for um, the plans. I mean, I'm, I'm, I share the view that, you know, what has been promised has been promised. Uh, and that people have worked for this and they have contributed for it. Um, I also caution, and as Ms. Lav mentions, every State pension system and every local pension system has got some, a little bit something different going on. Um, we know about the worst funded plans. And, but I would caution that Joshua Rao's paper is extremely important because, again, he is saying, okay, I grant you 8 percent returns, and he shows you a timetable of when, if there is no change to policy, these plans can expect to run out of assets. Thank you, Mr. Norcross. The gentleman's time is expired. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, I uh, certainly appreciate that. And uh, if I could uh, call up slide number one. Uh, this is a representation of uh, the, the difference between inflation, uh, the 1950 baseline. Uh, the difference, uh, the blue line would be 
uh, private spending increases since 1950 to now versus state and local government spending increases in the red line. Uh, private spending has increased five times, uh, but uh, local and state government spending has increased ten times. So it's it's not a, a question of a funding shortfall. It's it's a spending problem. Uh, would you concur with that, Ms. Norcross? Uh, I would say that's a big part of it. Yes. Okay. Now, in terms of um, uh, the discussion about uh, public pensions, understanding the magnitude of the problem is one thing we want to understand here today. If it's knowable, uh, Ms. Jelanus, uh, what what you mentioned in your testimony a funding shortfall. Is there a range uh, of, is there an agreement on what the funding shortfall is for public pensions? Well, there is, thank you, Chairman. There is not an agreement. A rough range would be $700 billion to $3 trillion. As you can see, that is a, a, a large range. This involves predicting things that are very difficult, really impossible to predict. You have to predict the performance not only of the U.S. stock market, stock market but of global equity and, and bond markets. You have to predict the course of future inflation okay. and also predict how long people and their survivors are going to live. Ms. So, Norcross, do you, do you concur with that, uh, I, that range? Yes. I, um, well, they're under a range of assumptions, yes. Uh, what, what, what would Meaning you say? Meaning the 700 um, billion would be under the current assumptions of the 8 percent discount rate range. Um, and that is why I am advocating for stress testing the pensions um, and, and granting economists uh, how, they would, how they would value the plan. Okay. What is the upward end? Um, 3.5 trillion. Okay. Now, uh, to, to this point, Ms. Gelanus, is there, is there um, uh, under current government accounting standards, uh, is it is it, uh, is it sufficient? Do we have enough transparency in understanding uh, the unfunded liabilities of these uh, state and local government pensions? No, it is not sufficient. I would advocate asking the states and large municipalities to report the assumptions, uh, report the liabilities under a range of assumptions, report it under a lower, what used to be called a risk-free rate, maybe 3 percent annual return, report it under the 8 percent return if, if they like to continue to do that, and allow investors to make up their mind. I don't think there is a big, there is a problem with disclosure, but it is not the biggest problem, because investors can do their own calculations on these liabilities. We have seen Dr. Ra and, and others do it on their own. And if investors do not like what is reported, they can simply not invest in the debt. So again, we should have more disclosure. But the problem is not that we don't understand the magnitude of the issue. It is getting the political will within states to change state constitutions which govern pension benefits for future workers, people who have not been hired, change state laws governing collective bargaining, wages, health care, and, and so forth. Uh, would you concur with that, Ms. Norcross? I, I agree. Well, that's Simple enough. Wow, we got that. <laughs> um, that that's it's reasonable. Um, it, are the government accounting standards for pensions uh, similar or dissimilar to what public companies are required to disclose, Ms. Norcross? Um, they're a little bit different in, in private sector defined benefit plans. They do use something closer to a risk-free rate, and they're um, um, valued a little bit differently than public sector plans. Ms. Jelanus, is that? Would you like to add anything to that? No. <laughs> wow. <laughs> it's going pretty smoothly. Um, so uh, in terms of Ms. Nor uh, Ms. Norcross, uh, in your testimony, uh, you discuss um, uh, that state spending grew faster than states' own revenue sources in, 40, uh, in 47 states from 1977 to 2007. Um, and uh, you know, to this point, can you explain the danger of, uh, of states reporting budgetary imbalances when they are actually using Federal funds um, and debt to fund these expenditures? I, th I think that just highlights the pie and what is in the pie. So you have State's own source revenue, you have Federal funds, debt, and other. Um, and a deficit, um, if you are just considering what a State can support on its own, that can be papered over if, if you then 
sort of discount that they are getting Federal funds, which can stimulate sometimes greater spending or cause the State to need to raise taxes to support that spending, and also the rising use of debt. And I agree that while debt is not a very large portion of budgets, we have seen some techniques recently where States will uh, bond, they will dump a trust fund, bond to replace it, and use that to balance the budget. So maybe they are not bonding directly for operating expenses, but they are. Uh, to that point, uh, have, have States uh, change the nature of what they use bonds for? The nature, rather than building a road, are they changing it to, to plug a pension fund problem? Has that changed? Um, we have seen more bonding for stuff like that. And also, you know, the definition of capital can be pretty flexible. Okay. Thank you for your testimony. My time has expired. Uh, and now, uh, Mr. Quigley, the ranking member, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> um, so far, the problems that we have seen with these uh, states, eight to ten states that are in particular trouble, seem to be uh, self-contained. I would like to ask any one of you, if you can, um, what the potential systemic risks are. Uh, I guess if the last economic crisis taught us anything is that everything is interconnected and in terms of the market or what have you, if there is a big hiccup, and there certainly are threats with some of these states. Uh, defaulting or having some other problems, missing payments and so forth. Uh, the impact on other states, the impact on bond ratings, but, but also the bond market itself. Um, so while there may be only 8 to 10 states, that is 25 percent of this country's population, what are the impacts on the rest of the states? Can I will uh, jump in on that really quickly. I think the risk of contagion is much less severe than it was in 2008 with the financial uh, institutions. I think the bond markets know the difference between the states that are in real trouble and the states that are not in. You think their investors do? I do. I do. Um, I, I, I think we have to have some confidence in the ability of the markets to make those distinctions. So that would be my first point. My, my second point um, would be that a lot of the problem with the financial institutions was hot money. It was that they depended really heavily on short-term financing, which was um, subject to immediate withdrawal. States are not subject to financing that is going to disappear instantly. They have tax revenues coming in. Um, they are likely to be able to continue borrowing. So I think it is a very different kind of crisis. Um, you know, it is possible to panic markets in the short term. Meredith Whitney succeeded in doing that in the municipal bond market um, by claiming the that they were going to The first time the name was mentioned yeah, we, today. You violated yeah. our rule. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, but you can, but in the long run, I mean, people realize what the fundamentals are, and you can see that there is um, beginning to be some improvements in that market now that that has been um, sort of kind of put to her. Okay. Comments have been put to rest. Um, so I think that there are distinctions among states. I, you know, the, the last time a state defaulted was in the Great Depression, and even in the Great Depression, only one state, Arkansas, defaulted. Only four cities or counties have default have actually defaulted since. Uh, 1970. Um, we're talking, you know, I don't think we're going to have um, a major default crisis. I think that um, there will be ways, you know, you're going to have some sewer districts and some, uh, you know, revenue bonds that, that were tied to the housing bubble and so forth that, that are going to have trouble paying, and those districts are going to have some problems, and the states will probably step in, as Pennsylvania stepped in in Harrisburg, and, and try and sort that out in a reasonable way. But I, you know, I just cannot see a scenario of major defaults and contagion. If I, may, if I may add to that, I would say one issue that risks courting a, a bond market uh, crisis <clears throat> would be changing the statute to allow for Federal bankruptcy. Because if I am a bondholder, for example, take New York's Metropolitan Transportation Authority, entity with $30 billion worth of debt, I have lent money to this entity based on a long list of covenants, including a state law that says that for as long as these bonds are outstanding, this entity will not declare bankruptcy. That is what New York lawmakers have determined under the democratic process. If there is any question that you have a new federal statute, that would somehow supersede that, or this idea that you could take away promises made to these bondholders to give to bondholders or unions at another state entity, 
this, this risk would take many months to sort out. I would also add maybe not the potential for an acute crisis that we saw in September 2008, but the potential for the risk of losses at banks, where you don't need a default for the market value of these securities to decline. You have got more than $200 billion of municipal debt in banks, similar amount in money markets and insurance funds. If banks worry that the value of these securities has declined, they may pull back on lending to the rest of the economy, again, not a crisis or a panic, but makes the recovery more difficult. The question is, what are you getting for making it more difficult? You are not getting much benefit because States have the tools to fix these problems. Can I just add one, one brief response, and that is, this is all assuming that the States wouldn't default on these bonds. I think the question we have to ask is, um, what are the possibilities? One possibility is no bankruptcy. They simply default completely. Right. Let me ask another question, Ms. Norcross. Uh, you talk about the rate of return and you advocate for reducing it to what you judge as a much more realistic figure. Uh, the same sort of question, uh, a quick shift from perhaps eight and a quarter or eight to, to four would have to have some sort of impact, pretty dramatic, obviously, from a fiscal point of view and how much would have to be, the contributions would have to be increased, but also within, again, the, the, the market that looks at this. Um, would you see this being done through an, a, a slower period of time, an adjustment period, or how would you see that work? Well, I agree with what Ms. Jelina uh, said in that you have to, you should probably grant a range of assumptions. Um, but the, the liability is the liability. So simply targeting a, a rate that makes it look a little bit better doesn't, um, it only masks over, you know, the underlying reality of what is owed. Um, and also, you know, if you are going to pay this out over 15 years, my concern is that in ca cases like Illinois where they are going to uh, take on more risk in their investment strategy to make up for what was lost. So that is what I would caution that. Thank you. Uh, I thank the Ranking Member, uh, Ms. Maloney of New York, recognized for five minutes. Thank, thank you, and I thank the Chairman and Ranking Member for organizing this important hearing and all of the panelists uh, for their thoughtful testimony. I, I would like to uh, gain a deeper understanding of the magnitude of the challenge, and I would uh, first like to ask uh, Ms. Norcross and Ms. Lav uh, to qualify and expand on a statement in uh, Ms. Lav's uh, testimony where you stated that states and localities devote 3.8 percent of their operating budgets to pension uh, funding. Uh, first, I would like to know where you got this number from, and is this an accepted number universally? And if that, in fact, is the correct number, uh, based on this number, uh, how can you uh, suggest that public pension costs um, are, are the, 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 the large costs of the State and local uh, financial problems. As we know, we are just uh, digging our way out from the Great Recession uh, that has impacted our entire country, and there are many costs there. But uh, could you comment uh, first, Ms. Norcross, and then Ms. Lav? Um, I, I believe uh, Ms. Lav gets that figure from the Alicia Munell uh, paper, um, and that is uh, what, her, what her estimate is of what States have been contributing on average. Uh, so that would be all plans. And she estimates then that if you use the 8 percent discount rate, you would have to raise that to 5 percent of budgets on average. Mm -hmm. That is correct. We worked with the uh, Boston College people, with Alicia Manel, um, using our expertise on State and local finance to help them come up with that figure. So, so how can you suggest that this is, is the cause of the local and, uh, and State financial problems if the contribution is just 3.8 percent? Um, it isn't. Um, <laughs> it isn't the cause. I mean, it is. You know, pensions um, contributions come from general funds, and the and the big deficit numbers, the 125 billion you're hearing about, is a general fund number. But pension contributions, neither pension contributions nor interest on bonds, are the major component of that. The major component of the deficits is the the expenditures states have and having, you know, Medicaid, health care and education and so mm -hmm. forth. So that is why I said, you know, it is not a crisis to raise from 3.8 percent to 5 percent, you know, in the way that state budgets, the state and local budgets are put together. Um, it, you know, you can do that over time. It is not, it's not a big crisis. And um, 
And, you know, there's a lot of this, all this talk about the riskless rate. That's one way to look at, look at the, um, uh, you know, and the Munell paper says you have to go to 9 percent, which would be a big problem uh, if you use the riskless rate. But there is a distinction between valuing the liabilities and how much you have to deposit to make the, um, the pension whole. And I would, you know, say that those are two different things. Well, on the risk riskless rate that a number of you testified on, I would like some clarification from it. Uh, is it true that this rate is different from what the private sector pension plans use? Is it different? Uh, private sector pension plans uh, admit they have a little more risk because a company can go bankrupt. They use the corporate bond rate to and reflect the risk. So why, it is why, it's higher than the riskless rate. The corporate bond rate is, I don't know, 5.5, 6 percent that they use. That's right. Why, why should there be a different rate for Pensions, public pensions and private pensions? Well, because private pensions have to be a little more conservative because a private company can go out of business and then they dump their liabilities for their pensions on the public benefit guarantee corporation, so ERISA, uh, which does not, so the Federal Government doesn't have to bail out the private corporation and pay those pension liabilities, insists that it uses a more conservative rate. But a public entity is not going out of business, and, and the public entity has taxing power and can adjust its taxes and expenditures, but it's going to be an ongoing entity. So, um, you know, there have been GAO reports and other observers. Most people who look at this say that you do not need a stringent standards for a public entity as you do for a private. Mm -hmm. So would the riskless rate um, increase the perceived pension shortfall? Yes, I, substantially. Um, and how does it increase it? Uh, it well, because, mm -hmm. um, you know, 60 percent of pension assets come from um, a, um, return on assets, come from investment income. So if you're going to say you're only going to get 4 percent on that investment income, then you have a much, and you're looking forward, and you're projecting that 30 years into the future, you're, you make a, a much larger hole that you have to fill. But, but if you say you're going to get 4 percent and you continue to invest in equities, then you're saying something that isn't true. And you're sort of saying you have to overfund this a pension in the front end um, because you're saying it's only going to be 4 percent, but if you get 7 percent or 8 percent, you're going to actually have more in it. And, you know, that will be even, I hate to say it, but it could end up with even more temptation for an overfilled pension fund to not have consistent contributions every year. It's much more realistic to say what you're going to uh, gain and consistently contribute the amount you need rather than having a feast or famine. Well, my time has expired. Anyone else like to comment on that? Um, I, I, would, I would just like to add, um, if I may, the, um, the logic behind that discount rate is, again, has to do with the safety or risk of what you're valuing. valuing. So a private sector plan reflects some of the risk involved that a company can go out of business, whereas the government is guaranteeing this 100 percent, saying you're, you're going to get paid. Um, and again, the long time horizon gets back to the idea that you have 15 years in which the majority of your obligations come due, and you're securing that with high volatile investments where you're lessening the likelihood that the money will be available to pay it out. And if I could comment as to the magnitude of pension liabilities, the reason why they don't show up as much at the State level is because these are the responsibility often of the local governments. They are set by State law but paid by the locality. For example, New York City will pay about $8.5 billion in pension obligations this year. That is more than 10 percent of, of the entire budget, including Federal funding for the city. So a much bigger problem at the local level rather than the State level. Thank you. My figures were State and local. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Quigley is recognized for a unanimous consent request. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I ask unanimous consent to enter into the record a statement from the Governor of Massachusetts. Without objection. So ordered. Uh, Mr. Cooper is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, the Ranking Member, for holding this excellent hearing. I would like to ask unanimous consent to insert into the record an article by Jeb Bush and Newt Gingrich in the Los Angeles Times entitled Better Off Bankrupt. Without, without objection. Okay. I think in finance hearings it is really important to keep things simple. <laughs> and it is my understanding that almost 80 percent of municipal bonds are owned by individuals in some form. Is that your understanding? These are more widely held by the tax exempt bonds. Yeah, I'm not sure. Individual investors. Yeah, the tax exempt bonds. And what most investors hate is a nasty surprise. 
a downside surprise. So in markets that function well and you have transparency and you have a heads up on coming bad news, people usually are less alarmed. So I want to ask a couple of questions about the transparency of these markets. What are we missing today in comparing um, these obligations between states that would enable an investor, an individual investor, to better evaluate these investments? And it's my understanding that some of these get packaged up in bond funds and, you know, they just want the tax break and that's the way they diversify their risk, but you don't want that bond fund to be harmed either. So what are we missing in terms of transparency between the states? With, are you asking me? With respect to bonds, I don't think there is anything missing. I think the bond raters have a great deal of information about the states and follow and the financial analysts and follow them uh, very closely. Um, and um, so I, you know, I'm not aware of um, anybody complaining about the transparency um, of bonds among the states. Moody's just put out a new kind of analysis where they um, added together the the outstanding um, bond debt and the um, and and pen and pension obligations so you could look at it in one place I think that's a good thing um, you know with respect to pension obligations I think there is a problem um, of not being able to look at state by state pensions on the same basis um, they exactly what are different. those problems um, they what use different standards. Um, there, there are a range of actuarial standards and pretty arcane that as to how you measure, measure future liabilities and so forth. And states can choose which ones they want. I mentioned at the beginning of this hearing that the Governmental Accounting Standings, Standards Board is very close to issuing a new standard that no longer will allow that and that will require. Um, and then, after that. GASB has a new standard, we will have an apples to apples comparison between the states? I believe so, yes. On pension obligations. Yes. Do all the panelists agree with that? I, I believe that's so. So this is pending, it's about to happen, and it that, doesn't require legislation. If, if I might clarify, is that, um, is that a rule that is going to require them to use a, the ABO versus the PBO? Um, those or are you referring to yeah. GASB 25? Uh, because the, GASB is also working on the discount rate rule, but I don't they're think they've solved that problem. Yeah, they've I mean, they're looking problem. both together. I mean, okay. the, they're, 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 I don't know what they're going to call. I don't so know what they're going to In the next few months, rule. we will have greater next comparability number. between the states so that we, an investor, an individual investor, can evaluate the risk involved in the most complex aspect of this, which is valuing pension obligations. That is my understanding. Of course, they haven't put out the final rule yet. They're still but they are working on it. Are all the panelists equally hopeful that GASB is about to do this positive the, step? I know they are looking at it, so I am hopeful. <laughs> they have taken all the comments. They had a draft rule in September, and they are very far down the line. Um, and I think it is appropriate because all of the stakeholders have had a chance to comment. It is not so, something that is being imposed by fiat, and a lot of, I mean, various people object to various parts of the rule, but it is going to be a standard rule and um, better than the one we have. So does the Manhattan Institute and the University of Pennsylvania mm -hmm. Law School concur in this? I'm not following this that closely, so I'll, I'll be agnostic on it. Mm -hmm. I will as well. I have no prediction on, on how they will come out. Mm -hmm. You mentioned earlier rating agencies' analyses. The rating agencies don't have the credibility that perhaps they once had prior to the housing crisis. Are the rating agencies on top of these? developments between and among the states and municipalities? I think they are. There are rating agencies and then there are a whole host of other financial analysts mm. out there that specialize in looking that are not the rating agencies, which I agree have lost some credibility, but the, um, but the um, who, who look at this and who have specialists who spend, you know, all their time looking at state and local finance. And um, I mean, I think they have a pretty good handle on what's going on. And, um, and to the one, and I cite that in my report, that they are saying there is no major um, um, chance of a contagious default, you know, if there are a couple of extra defaults are likely to be in non, um, in, you know, small things like sewer districts and not in major areas. I see that my time has expired, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, I, I thank the gentleman. Um, and uh, if, if it is okay with the panel, uh, we have opportunity to go for a second round of questions if you are uh, no pressing concerns uh, this morning. Um, 
And so with that, I recognize myself for five minutes. Uh, so the definition of default is to fail to fulfill a contract agreement or duty, to fail to perform, pay, or make good. So if we look at default in the bond market, does the bond market define that narrowly, which is to make good on your payment to me, or, or as can we as policymakers define it more broadly, which is um, fair to fill, fulfill an obligation to the people you are serving, fulfill, uh, failure to uh, pension holders, for in instance, um, and not being able to pay pension holders, or could it be uh, not making good, so you have to sell a city or state asset in order to pay bondholders, which is uh, an interesting piece here. But beyond that, as Federal policymakers, are we making the matter worse through our transfer payments to the States? There has been some point of reference uh, in testimony here today that that is, in fact, the case. You, Ms. Norcross, your written testimony includes uh, some discussion of this. But to the tune of you know, hundreds of billions of dollars a year, there are state, uh, Federal transfers to States. There are also Federal mandates on the States that are cost drivers to government. Can you touch on this and the implications it has, obviously, for the bond market and indebtedness and the taxpayers? Well, of, of course, the most um, well-known maintenance of effort would be currently with the Medicaid um, requirements on the States. Um, and there are many other grants and aid that um, are handed out to the States that occasionally come with maintenance of effort requirements or may encourage that municipality or um, government to need to raise taxes to support the spending. Um, I, I don't know if I answered your question. I, you, you did. Um, now, there are certain, certain States that are in uh, different fiscal situations, and uh, I know some research has been done on this. Um, and so, you know, does that the uh, the difficulty of policymakers to balance the budget, does that have a bearing on their credit rating? Certainly it does, one would believe. Uh, Ms. Gelinas, and in terms of your discussion of various uh, subgroupings of the State, not the general obligation bonds, but obviously the, the, the dormitory authority or a, a road authority, um, it, does that have a bearing, uh, the, the State revenue sources, the, the, the uh, whether or not they are sustainable. Uh, can you touch on that? Sure, it does. And without saying whether the ratings agencies are right or wrong, either on the broad issues or narrow credits, the ratings agencies do have a good understanding that each bond is different, even at the State level. So California, for example, they have said very clearly, paying debt service on general obligation bonds this is one of two top priorities for the State, that even if California has massive budget deficit, they pay these bonds first before they pay anything else. So ratings agencies look at that, see the structure of, of the law and precedents, and that goes into the analysis. Other States, it may not be as high a priority, but it is a very high priority in every State. And then when you look at things like bonds that are tax secured, where the State has said, we pledge this sales tax to pay bonds before we use the sales tax for anything else. That is actually higher than a general obligation bond. That gets AAA rating in a lot of cases because of that. So you have got to look at each of the repayment streams, the character of the State, the willingness of the State to pay the debt, and sometimes, frankly, the willingness of the State to make bad decisions. We saw in Illinois State raised taxes to give comfort to the bondholders. So trying to get more market discipline in getting the bondholders to care more about the fundamentals, it doesn't necessarily get you a good long-term decision for the State if the response of the State is to raise taxes. may make the long-term situation worse, not better. Well, certainly appreciate that. In today's Wall Street Journal, <laughs> there is a story about this hearing, and they reference that California borrowers uh, borrows billions of dollars each year to cover season, seasonal shortfalls in its cash flows. Illinois is, pro is proposing to issue uh, an $8.7 billion debt restructuring bond to pay past uh, due bills and a $3.7 billion uh, bond to make required pension contributions to its pension system. Uh, there is a larger discussion here. Um, 
uh, about whether these states will be able to afford higher interest rates on these bonds following the end of quantitative easing and the impacts that that will have on their uh, pension fund gap. So uh, I could just ask the, the panel to make comments on that briefly, and would certainly like to hear your testimony. Um, you right. Oh. right. Higher interest rates are certainly a risk, not only having to do with the fundamentals of the municipal bond market, but also how do global investors feel about the prospects of inflation in the U.S. If Treasury bond rates go up, it is likely that municipal bond rates will go up at the same time. I will just add that those effects are likely and already are disproportionately uh, borne by the states that are in big trouble. So California's uh, interest rate is much higher than other states' interest rates. That is what we would expect, and I, I think in the long run that is what we want. That is what we want the bond markets to be doing. Uh, I concur with what um, Professor Skeel said. I would distinguish those um, different things. California issues revenue and a few other states issue revenue anticipation notes. They pay them back within the same year. That is not borrowing for operating expenses. It is just changing the timing of their borrowing, um, whereas the Illinois bonds are actually borrowing for operating expenses, um, which is a big distinction. Um, of course, you know, the expenses will go up um, if interest rates go up. But as I showed, that um, that total interest on bonds are, you know, depending on the source used to calculate it, only 4 or 5 percent of total state and local um, expenditures. So, again, this is not something that is going to break the bank if it goes up to from 4 percent to 5 percent to 6 percent of expenditures. It is on the margin. They will have to accommodate it, but it is not going to break the bank. Uh, thank you. And uh, Mr. Quigley is recognized for five minutes. Again, uh, thanks to our panelists. Uh, and the chairman for participating in this. It is a very good first effort by the chairman and the committee on an important issue. Um, before I ask you, I guess, my last question, um, the, the thoughts for local governments, uh, state and local governments, is that, uh, from my point of view, the mission matters. We often hear so much that you know, people don't like government. But when it comes to local government, when they call 911, they want a fireman or uh, an ambulance or a police officer to respond, and they want to know that when they cross a bridge it's it's safe. And so much of local government strikes so close to home. There's a the wheels hit the street. And uh, so what we're talking about today is so important because the poor financial management can put all those things at risk. So beyond the financial management dealing with pensions and so forth, it, it's really the notion that governments need to look at themselves and, and reinvent themselves. And I'm not just speaking as a, a congressman, but I was a Cook County commissioner for 10 years. All local governments need to reinvent themselves, streamline and consolidate, not because they don't matter, but because they matter very, very much. So there's a lot at stake here. Um, and I want to commend the panelists. With one exception, you kept your bond that you weren't going to mention the name that <laughs> shall not be mentioned. <laughs> But it really, it's still the big question. What a lot of public, the public wants to know: um, to what extent could there be significant defaults or uh, significant uh, bond defaults in the year 2011 or 2012? I don't think there'll be a city or a county that defaults. I think there will be some defaults in special districts and on revenue bonds. For which, you know, if so, for example, you know, in Florida there were they, there were bonds issued for um, sewers in a development that never got built because the the um, the housing bubble burst. Well, there's no way, you know, you can't pay back those bonds because there's no <coughs> sewer revenue coming in. There's those kinds of things around the country that are going to be a bit of a problem and that could be. Um, defaults or restructuring. I mean, as, as the chairman said, the term default is being used in a number of different ways. And, you know, I use it as in you don't make the interest payment on the bond, not that you find it, um, some other way to, to pry it. But again, you know, and there always are some projects that go bad in a bad economy, but I don't think there will be any major um, large city or county that defaults 
Um, you know, there are, and I think that um, by and large, that even for smaller ones, that the states will step in. And, you know, I mean, we've got a control board now in Nassau County, New York. And there will be, you, we're going to see it, quite a number of control boards, I think, that states come in and, 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 and impose control boards on localities that are in trouble and make them figure out a plan for working their finances out. I'll just uh, add, I also don't think there will be 50 to 100 defaults, but I think it's really important to keep in mind we don't know. Um, probably 50 states will survive, but if only 48 states survive the current crisis, we're, we're in trouble. And I think we really need to plan for that. We need to plan for surprises in a way that in 2008 we had not planned for surprises. As a democratic people in each state, we don't have to wait for the bond markets to make common sense decisions today. Uh, we know state by state and for the nation as a whole, we have got to control our health care costs for public employees as, as well as other people as well, retiree pension liabilities. These are all things that if we do not get a handle on them, we will not be building or repairing roads, bridges, transit because we are paying these growing retiree costs. These are things we can fix today. We, sh we shouldn't and don't have to wait for bond markets to tell us to do what we should be doing already. Uh, I, I would concur with what Ms. Delina said. Thank you, and I yield back. Mr. Cooper is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would like to thank you again and the ranking member for this excellent hearing. Back to the question of individual investors. If I am an individual bondholder today or a local taxpayer who is thinking about maybe buying some of these bonds, what is the easiest way for me to find on the Web or another source the credit status, credit rating, uh, financial soundness of the entity in which I am investing or living? Um, bond prospectuses have a whole lot of information about the finances but, of a state but or that's the locality a big, of the, I mean, it depends. Prospectus you know, is a big, long legal document, sometimes hundreds of pages, very difficult for the average. What is the fine, best way for a consumer who maybe is at the broker's office saying, I want a tax-free bond? Tell me what I should buy. How do you find out that information? How do you tell whether you are living in a creditworthy jurisdiction or not? This is the information age. Is there a website you can go to and find out with relative ease, small town USA, is it worth it or not? I, I think it is fairly difficult. You have to piece together information, but all of the brokerages uh, publish reports or put out reports on individual bonds. So certainly if you go to a broker, you can get that kind of information. If, but to, to assemble it together yourself, I think, is still a little bit difficult. But that is why most people don't, you know, do rely on, it, on financial advisors and, and, and on brokers rather than make their own decisions, oh. or, or for at least for information. And it depends, as um, Jelina said, it depends on what kind of a bond it is, you know. So it may, you, you may be wanting to know about the possibility of the, you know, are the tolls going to, you know, pay back the uh, bond on this um, highway, or it may be full faith and credit, in which case you need to have some sense about the budget of the entity and, the, and its long-term prospect. But when Ms. Jelina said earlier that individual citizens should take it upon themselves to get ahead of the bond markets, anticipate bad practices, it is very difficult to do that. You really have to be a student of this to understand what is going on. Right. And, and I think people, you know, just like, and you know, I go to a lawyer, I go to a doctor, you but, know, I mean, I am a finance person, but everybody isn't and they need to go to a But for the individual company. investor, it should be re made investment. relatively easy. And it is my understanding that some of the brokerage houses may be affiliated with investment banks that help underwrite the bonds and they have an interest in making those bonds look good. Mm -hmm. yeah, that may be the case. Um, you know, there is not a lot of um, way that an individual can investigate the, um, you know, most towns have their budgets on the website. I can find them. Yeah, but, um, but it may not tell you everything you want to we know. We can compare almost that. everything else in life through easily accessible websites. These important financial instruments, why can't we get 
an easy handle on these? There are 80,000 jurisdictions in the United States, or I think some, some people say 90,000, that issue bonds. <laughs> it's, real, it's, it's, it's quite a large undertaking and well, one that maybe somebody would want to undertake, but well, it, it would be a big deal. But perhaps the more relevant question is so many people buy a bond fund, which may have a few bad apples in it. How do you tell what is in your bond fund? Because it's my understanding with the housing crisis, they bundled subprime credits, and when a few more went under than expected, that tainted the whole package. That was a different kind of, um, that was really, those were kind of what people call sliced and diced um, <laughs> um, securities where so people didn't know being, what the origin is. That's this not being done with totally, any bonds no, today? No, never. It's not done. The bond funds, you know, without endorsing or not endorsing them, there is at least something there, unlike with something like a, a uh, collateralized debt obligation built on mortgage bonds, built on more mortgage bonds. Some of these things were rated AAA. They end up, ended up being worth literally nothing. I don't see how that would be the case here, even if we did see small-scale uh, municipal and project defaults that it, it's hard to conceive waking up and having a AAA rated municipal bond fund being worth nothing. However, I, I think your other point is, is very important that individuals own these bonds, but they don't own them directly. They own them through money markets, $300 billion worth of state and local debt in money market funds. And there is an issue here of financial intermediation and the dealer's responsibility that these are the large investment banks. They run these funds. They hold many holdings on their own books. And if we haven't succeeded in getting financial discipline into these firms that still believe in many cases they're too big to fail, they're not going to be worried about state and local debt because they think Congress will bail out them, not the states. Would any of you invest today in a, a bond fund in the hunt for yield with higher tax-free interest rates and uh, project funds in Nevada? Southern California, Florida, <laughs> would you put your life savings or your pension fund in a fund like that, especially since it's apparently quite difficult to find out about the merits of each individual project? I would be careful, but, uh, but I certainly wouldn't steer away from the muni market. I mean, I... I, well, I asked about project funds, because well, what have to look said the would be the most likely to have problems. You would have to look at the project and, and certainly... But apparently that is almost impossible to do unless you are a bond lawyer and willing to read 200 pages per uh, well, project. I mean, if, if you are going to invest in a particular project, you probably But this probably would be a bond be. fund with lots of these projects. It just seems to me that we are not giving consumers, individual investors, enough information here. At least that is easily accessible. But I see that my time has expired, too. I appreciate the Chairman's patience. Uh, I, I certainly appreciate the gentleman's line of questioning. If, and if the panel wants to go through, the, the, the question was, would you invest in state municipal bond funds, you yourself? Uh, yes or no, maybe. Uh, if if you all want to answer, that would be great. I think there is a very real problem with trust, people's trust in the financial industry and trusting their financial advisors and trusting the managers of these bond funds, and that issue is not going away anytime soon. Ms. Norcross, Ms. Lav? Um, I, I would probably ask my financial planner. And <laughs> 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 I have never actually invested in municipal bonds. It is just not my style of investment. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I thank the gentleman from Tennessee for his line of questioning. And with that, we will go to Mr. Walsh of Illinois. Thank you, minutes. Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for holding such an important hearing. <clears throat> like the ranking member, uh, I'm from Illinois as well. Illinois is a mess. We all know that. Um, it, no way is the federal government going to bail out my state. My voters just our constituents won't allow it. It. it I, I feel like I left the movie uh, right before the good part, um, and I'm, I'm sure the case was being made that bankruptcy isn't feasible. So no bailout. Bankruptcy, bankruptcy isn't feasible. Um, let me just start out with a real quick round robin question. Um, give, me, give me your 20-second solution then, just so I can, I can walk out of here with that takeaway. We are not going to bail you out. Uh, bankruptcy is probably not feasible. So what are the states going to do? Let's just, I mean, just hop 
and, and give a quick one to that. Go ahead, Ms. Jillings. Well, I think voters in many states are already doing the right thing. We have got new governors from both parties that are starting to address what do we do about pensions for future employees, what do we do about Medicaid costs, something Congress can certainly help with. The, these are questions for voters in the individual states pressuring their own lawmakers to change state laws and, in some cases, state constitutions, yes. not something the Federal Government can or should do for them. So in some ways the system is working, if imperfectly. I guess my question is, if, if there is going to be no bailout from us and bankruptcies aren't feasible, a state is falling off the cliff. Let's imagine that one in the next two or four months literally is going to fall off the cliff. Uh, we can change laws that will impact things in the future, but what do you do for that state that's just fallen off the cliff, Mr. Steele? Excuse well, me. my my answer is going to be: I really think we need to put a bankruptcy uh, okay. regime in place to deal with precisely that problem. That's that's the only problem we absolutely need bankruptcy for. And I'll add one thing to that, which is. Uh, I agree that states are doing the right thing, and I, I hope the optimism we have heard today is correct, that most of them can muddle their way through. But some measures are a lot tougher than others. For instance, yeah. pension reform uh, in a state, well, there, there's a lot of debate in Illinois about what can and can't be done right now. But in many states, require, does require a constitutional change, and I think that is pretty unrealistic. So, um, so some of the options are more feasible than others. Ms. Norcross, your state is falling off a cliff. What are you going to do? Um, I would say close the defined benefit plan and figure out how you are going to pay out what has uh, what's been accumulated. Slap. Um, I think states can use their normal processes of dealing with their taxes and their expenditures uh, to um, set themselves on a, a right path. Illinois has a particularly deep hole. I have been writing and talking about Illinois' problems for the last 25 years of, of its fiscal mismanagement. Um, I am a native Chicagoan. But the, um, it's, um, um, but it can you know, it just needs to do those things it needs to do to, to, to get out of it and to get, bring, bring itself <clears throat> balance. And it has the tools. It just needs to use them. Thank you. Let me, let me uh, in, in my remaining time, let me quickly just ask a, a, a one quick question about market risk. Uh, Bill Gross, who manages PIMCO, one of the largest mutual funds um, in, in the country, uh, he stated that a low or negative real interest rate for an extended period of time is the most devilish of all policy tools. Uh, it is interpreted to mean what he is saying is that the Fed's action to lower interest rates helps our debtors, such as states and municipalities, while harming all those who worked hard and saved money. Um, Ms. Norcross, Ms. Gelanis, quickly. In effect, the Fed is enabling debtors to reduce their debt uh, on the backs of those that saved money. Is that right? Um, I, I, would, I would hesitate to, to say that um, right now. But Ms. Gillanis? There is complacency. States and cities have borrowed at very low rates, not just <clears throat> the past couple of years in extreme conditions, but really for two decades now. If rates go up, including you know, possibly way up, they will have to get used to a very different environment very quickly. Could you argue that the, the Fed's quantitative easing program is in effect, has in effect been a bailout for states and municipalities? Sure, this is a this is a bailout for anyone who who owes money. In states and municipalities may not be the biggest proportionate benefit of this, uh, but it it certainly helps them. Ms. Norcross, you'd concur. I, I concur. Okay, thank you, and, and Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Ms. Burkle from New York. It's <clears throat> recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for uh, hosting this very important meeting uh, coming from New York State. As you can imagine, this is a concern on many of our minds. I apologize. We have had a number of hearings today for being in and out, but I appreciate your time this morning. Um, the first question I want to ask is regarding uh, actually the stimulus money and the fact that so much of it was paid to the states. Do you think that that was a way the states were um, sort of put the states off, they didn't have to really face these issues head on, and so it actually uh, delayed, and now that now the states have to reckon with the situation, and that's a question for any one of you. Yeah, I'm happy to respond to that. When that money first came out in 2009, we would have seen um, it, it, it covered about a third of the state's deficits, and in that year, 
we would have seen very um, sharp cuts in education and health care. Um, we would have seen millions of people losing their health insurance, um, and, um, and um, the states were poised to cut people, and we would have seen you know, many, many more layoffs of teachers and other public employees, which would, in fact, have um, potentially delayed recovery, um, because you take that demand out of the economy and, um, you know, it, it, um, uh, the stimulus, um, you know, actually provided a boost to the economy that was very important. Um, and so now, as the stimulus is ending, um, at least state revenues are beginning to grow again. They are still below 2008 levels, but they are beginning to grow again. And so states have at least a, a little more ability to, um, to absorb the end of the stimulus. They, they are proposing very major cuts um, in budgets this year. Um, but it is probably better that they are doing it now, as the economy is at least on, a, on something of a growth path, than, than they did it in the depth of the recession, which could have been very damaging to the economy. But I think now that it seems to me, at least, that those decisions that they are making now, or they should have made a year ago and actually got their fiscal houses in order. It appears that the stimulus just delayed reckoning with the reality of the situation. Mr. Skeel? Uh, I agree. I mean, there is some case for uh, some of the stimulus money going to states, but there is no question in my mind that it, it has delayed the, the restructuring. Yes, I would agree with that. There was a missed opportunity in that uh, Congress might have considered saying to the states, we will give you a dollar today in 2009 if you take steps to cut your future liabilities by a dollar 10 years from now, so fix, fix the pensions, fix the health care, Medicaid costs, give them the operating aid now, but use it as leverage to work on the long-term problems. And that was something that was not done. I would add to that that um, some of the stimulus, in, in fact, expanded some spending and uh, is leading to cuts being needed to be take, taken today. And, you know, states, uh, Virginia and New Jersey, deferred their pension payments. Uh, they were not making the tough choices. Thank you. While I still have some time, if I could ask another question. Mr. Skeel, if, um, regarding the possibility of bankruptcies in some of the states that are so financially strapped, if, in fact, they did declare bankruptcy, would that affect the borrowing abilities of, of healthier states? Does that impact a state that kept its fiscal house in order and now uh, they are going to be impacted by someone else's state who did not? I think the impact would be very limited. As I was uh, saying a few minutes ago, uh, the bond markets have the ability to distinguish between states that are in good fiscal shape and states that are not. It is really not like the big banks in 2008, which were really connected to each, each other, had the same kinds of assets, the same kinds of problems. The states really are independent. And, and so I, I think a state that is in good fiscal health would continue to be able to borrow just fine. Thank you. Um, Ms. Jolinas, I think in your opening statement you possibly address that. If you would like to, in the few uh, seconds that are left, address that issue as well. Sure. I would respectfully disagree. Markets can distinguish among states, but they cannot do it instantaneously or even in a few weeks or even months. So changing the law in this way, really sweeping away half a century's worth of precedent, it would take a long time for markets to adjust to that, and healthier states would, would suffer during that time frame as well. Now, can I just add one, one last re remark on that? And that is, when you look at countries that have run into trouble, Argentina, for instance, which is about as profligate as you can get, it is remarkable how quickly they can go back to the markets. I, I really believe markets respond a lot more quickly than people tend to think. Thank you. Thank you. I yield back. Uh, thank you so much for your line of questioning. And uh, I have got uh, just three more questions that I wanted to pose to the panel, uh, if that is all right with you all. Um, you know, if, if you look at the public sector employees' unions versus private sector uh, employee unions, um, the public sector unions uh, are now account for more uh, than private sector uh, unions. Um, it, it, interesting crossover we have had just in the last two years. Um, and on average, uh, uh, public sector workers um, make 
uh, more per hour in total compensation, wages and benefits, than their private sector counterparts. Uh, Ms. Jelinas, you have written about this, I know, but if you could testify uh, and, and say here today, it, it seems to me that public sector employees and private sector employees are living in two separate economies. Um, what are the ramifications of that, and what is, the, what is really the, the root cause of that disparity? Yes, and I should be clear that it differs from state to state. Some, some states, particularly the northeastern states, Illinois, California, offer much greater power to employees to collectively bargain. Their, their benefits are commensurately much higher. Looking, generalizing the problem, it would not be so much the wages as it is the benefits, because these are open-ended liabilities that states and localities are, are taking on. Right now, they are, they are uncontrolled. So one aspect of getting these under control is to start to switch new civilian employees, a good first start, into 401k style pension plans, just as the private sector has. So you are getting rid of an open-ended liability for the State in the future. Same thing with health care benefits. In many municipalities, certainly not all of them, workers do not pay a share or anywhere near the share of their own health care benefits that private sector workers pay. Asking workers to pay more for their own health care do much to help states and cities with these liabilities. So you mentioned the, uh, switching from a defined benefit um, uh, plan to a 401 k style, which most Federal employees have, um, for instance, just as a for instance. Um, that is one policy change that we could, uh, that the States could enact. What are the policy, um, what, what are the prescriptions that, that uh, the, the Federal Government can take action over uh, to help stem the tide that, that we see coming? Uh, Ms. Lav talked about the loss of revenue and the fact that stimulus funds uh, sort of uh, uh, a limit, you know, uh, relieve the states of that burden of having to lay off workers. But if you look at local school boards right now, with a loss of the stimulus funds, you're having hundreds of people show up at school board meetings because they're talking about layoffs. So what I believe, it, what I saw, and I think a lot of folks saw, is that the day is coming, the day of reckoning is coming, when those stimulus funds run out, and rather than realizing it two years ago and making changes, they are having to do it now. What are the things we, here in Congress, what policy uh, changes can we make to help stem this crisis? And I will pose that for everyone. Well, I think We will uh, we'll start with Mr. Dillon. Oh, I am sorry. And we will go across. One area where it may be most straightforward for Congress to help States is in Medicaid, because this is not an issue where Congress would be telling States, you have to change your pension plan, you have to change the way you govern yourselves. Medicaid is, is currently a program that encourages States to spend more, because when a State spends a dollar more, sometimes it gets more than a dollar back from Washington, gradually changing Medicaid into a block grants program where you offer set amount of money, increases on a set formula and the States are encouraged to innovate and cut costs within that, reward them uh, for cutting costs rather than raising costs, this would approach uh, another big chunk of, of their costs, current and future. Okay. Mr. Skill? I agree that Medicaid is the most obvious place to, to do things. There are real limits on what you all can do, say, with pensions and things of that sort, simply for State sovereignty reasons. So uh, places where there is al already Federal funding are the places I think you look first. Mr. I, I concur. Medicaid and other areas, K through 12, education, or where there are mandates that um, increase fiscal pressure on States. I don't think, um, you know, in the, on the areas we were talking about today, that there is any need, as I said, for federal intervention. I would other you know, than money. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm not asking the, for the extension of the stimulus. I mean, it was unfortunate that it was designed so that the economy would already be recovered when the mm -hmm. stimulus ended. Revenues are still below their 2008 levels, so of course, 
the end of the stimulus, states were not able to get back to sure, where sure. there was. So, you know, the econ you know, helping the economy, there is not much you can do to help the economy right now either, necessarily. So, um, but with respect to Medicaid, I think that, you know, you can easily talk about a block grant, but Medicaid is actually more efficient in many ways than private insurance um, per, per individual matched for health. Um, 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 uh, sure. conditions. So I think that the, the best thing would be to figure out how to control the rate of growth of health care costs in the eco economy wide. Um, all the, those scary GAO numbers that Ms. Norcross mentioned are entirely driven by the rate of growth of health care costs. If health care costs continue to grow faster than GDP, states are going to have trouble. Coping with that, so will the Federal Government. It is a major driver of the Federal deficit, and figuring out how to bring them under control is the best thing to do. Final question of the day, and this is something that I intend to ask future panels as well. We are going to have a series of hearings about this fiscal crisis at the State level and the ramifications of not addressing it. And this is the opening of it, and we wanted to hear from informed individuals to, to start this process. But I would like for you all to, to, if you could, if you, I am asking you on the spot, but in the future as well, to tell us who we should hear from next, bond market participants, credit rating agencies, pension holders, unions. It, it, just, you know, if you could, tell me one, two, three people that, uh, or entities we should hear from. Ms. Lab, and we will just go right down the line. Um, yeah, well, that was a pretty good list. I think finan <laughs> financial analysts. There are several that have a very good handle on this. I can suggest a few. Um, you know, send it to you. Um, and of course, unions have a major stake in this, and you should you should hear from them. Um, and um, I mean, I think you also should listen to the governors and the mayors. Thank you, Ms. Norcross. Um, I, I concur that is a good list to start with, um, and also consider uh, um, calling those who are involved in education finance and financing other policy areas. I would just add, um, I, I think you all should talk to pension lawyers, because the, these issues are both economic and legal, and I, I think you need to see the whole picture. Sure. Thank you. All of those people, and I would also suggest speaking with infrastructure people, because the other side of this is that states have to grow. Private sector can't create jobs when we have infrastructure that is decaying. And so how, how can sp states spend Congress's money and their own money, get the biggest bang for their buck in infrastructure, and help grow the state so that these liabilities can be better controlled from that end as well? Thank you. Thank you. And I certainly appreciate your testimony. I uh, appreciate the uh, opportunity from here, uh, to hear from you. Thank you for your time, and uh, uh, thank you for spending uh, um, the, the morning with us. Thanks so much. Oh, thank, thank you. you. And this meeting is adjourned.